<laughs> Say hi to everybody as you come on. <clears throat> I'm just waiting here because we have lots of people coming. So it's very interesting. I can read nobody's name. <laughs> But we we see your name here there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so much for us. <laughs> well, that's okay. We'll we'll get to that in a minute. And yeah. my name is international. I am Valentina. Valentina. Okay, so now I can make some interesting right. Um some interesting connections, right? Valentina. Okay, right. Oh. I, I can read. I can see Anna. <laughs> I mean, I can see the name. That one's a pretty easy guess. And I could see Ekaterina at some point because there was a skater that with, had that name, right? And so that was a name that I knew. But I can't read any of... Oksana? <laughs> Getting better. Right. I have, I have written my name in English as well. Oh, good. Okay. So, right. Uh, I'm a Alex. It's very simple. A N. Well, Alex. Alex is great. Yeah. So uh, that's that's good. <laughs> yeah. If you oh. if you read the acronym A N T, that makes and. I usually sign off by one word and. <laughs> right. I, I, I'm happy with that. Okay. Right. 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 Uh, right. B by the way, I would like to ask you. It's a usual controversy with us. Is it either or Heather? I, I would say Heather. Heather. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It is Heather. Yes. Like, like the plant. Like the yeah, in the marshes. Yeah, exactly. And that's what the name is from. It's basically a little Scottish. It's a weed, essentially. Yeah. But, you know, it's a flower. Yes, that's right. Can My it. name is usually very difficult for people who are non-English speakers because I have two thes in it and I have lots of R's and an initial H and all kinds of sounds that in many languages are really difficult. So it's Heather <laughs> Wotherington. Yeah, but, 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 you know, in Russian, we have got the established tradition to transliterate to your name as Heather. I don't know why, but they all Heather, but instead of Heather. <laughs> it's my answer to anything remotely close. <laughs> right. uh, so I'm going to wait till Olga gives me the flag when I can start. Uh, I understand you've been at it for the whole day. Uh, it is 10 o'clock in the morning for me, so I'm nice and fresh. Uh, if um, we can wait, sorry uh, to interrupt you, Heather, if we can wait for a few more minutes, because I yeah. still see we have more than 10 people who registered. So uh, can you continue with this small talk? <laughs> for a few yeah, minutes? sure. I'm great at small talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's and, it. <laughs> and in fact, we'll, we'll use this, in fact, just to go around the board. I know you're not going to be seeing the same order as I am. And the problem is, is I, I'm going to have to really think about how to pronounce. Like the H is uh, an N, basically, right? So, so if I see an H, I make a N sound. That much yeah. I have because yeah. Anna is A H H A. Okay, so let me try this. So let me introduce myself while other people are coming. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you get to to know or to read, uh, but my name is Heather Lotherington, and I'm at York University in Toronto. So I'm in a very multilingual context, and I don't know where any of you are and your circumstances and who you teach and what languages you teach. I assume English for a lot of you. I work in multilingual education. So a lot of what I do has to do with language policy and what happens in schools. Because in our country, we have two languages, English, French, but in Toronto, we have hundreds of languages that are spoken by people in every neighborhood because over half of the city is, it's an immigrant based city. And so over half of the city speaks something else. So I work with the issues of policy education and increasingly with language and its forms in digital context, which is what brings us here today. So. Uh, Alex, you already told me your name. Why don't you tell me where you're 
where you're located, I assume you teach English, but you can, you can uh, tell me. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm with um, Guillemot. Well, the, the university that you are addressing now, well, uh, <laughs> today I am at home. Uh, working over Zoom with you, and I teach English. I, I, I've been teaching for for three, no, 40 years now. Okay. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> 40 years. Oh, time, time flies, right. <laughs> and uh, I, I've been doing this practically all my life, right? And that's yeah. what I do. Mm -hmm. Right, that's great. It's so teaching very, very different people, starting from kids, mm -hmm. uh, grown-ups, and uh, my my second interest is uh, American history. And at uh, at a certain point in time, I was teaching American history to 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 high school kids. Well, I bet that was interesting. I got to say. So do I read Natalia? Would that be a good guess? Uh, that's the next face I see. Would that yeah, be yeah, exactly. So I have written also my name in English to make it easier for you. I don't know if I'm seeing the same person. Ah, I'm seeing one over here. There's two. Right. Okay. Keep going. Right. I see you. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So um, I also represent Gimo. So I haven't been teaching here for as many years as uh, you've been teaching, but still for, tw no, no, not for 20 years, but for 18, I think, years I've been teaching English. Mm. So, but uh, I'm at a different English chair because we have lots of English chairs at our university. I don't know if you know that, mm. but we have a special English chair for each of our departments. So each department has its own English chair. Seven and all. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a big university then, I take it. What's the size of the university? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, 6,000 students. 60, maybe? Six. Only six? 6,000, as far as I know, yeah. I'm not sure. So I don't know. Well, it's a big university anyway. So, and uh, the fact that we have so many English chairs shows that uh, we pay a lot of attention to language teaching here. So, uh, because education is very specialized, I mean, so um, those who work at international journalism department, for example, specialize in teaching English for journalists and those who work at uh, international law department. 50, 52 languages in all, yes. The rector said today, I, well, amazing, 52 languages. Okay, I am at home with that. All right, it's seven after ten. Yes, and yes, I think we, we've given quite enough time for late commas. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's, oh, I've got a couple of things in the chat already. Nice to meet everybody here, too. So here's what I'm going to do. I have a, a partial presentation. I have a plenary tomorrow, but I also, because I have, as it were, the cart before the horse, I have the workshop before the actual plenary. Um, I have a little bit of sort of slide stuff that I want to work with too. So I'm going to share the screen to start and sort of intermittently come back to you. So here we go. So let's see. Okay. All right. So let me just check whether everybody is, if you just give me a thumbs up, if you can, or actually it'll be Olga, I think, who tells me, if you can see okay, it's coming across okay. Good. Very good. Okay. So uh, first thing I want to say is thank you actually for this wonderful opportunity. How I wish I could go. Wow. That would be so exciting. Meanwhile, we are locked down in Toronto. We have been locked down for months now, which is terrible. Okay. So we're going to look at something called production pedagogies. How familiar you are with this kind of ideal, I'm soon to find out. But what we're really looking at is learner agency in digital language learning. So here's the central problem, and it's a big one, that we've got a theory practice divide, that still a lot of the materials, the curricula, the examinations, certainly the ideals, the models, the norms, everything come from 20th century norms about English, ideals of English, theories of English. 
Yet none of us talk that way. The bulk of education, or the bulk, excuse me, of uh, communication these days is on smart devices, which all of us have in our back pocket, in front of us, we're using now. And that's how we use language, but it is not how we teach language. And my big question is, why not? So, um, here is what classrooms looked like 100 years ago on the left side in the black and white. And underneath that classroom, which I believe is in Canada, and underneath it, that's in Canada, that's a hospital 100 years ago as well, 19, I don't know, you know, 10 or something. And that, uh, if you take a look at the hospital 100 years ago, and you take a look at the same surgical room, that's the same hospital, uh, 100, maybe 110 years later, what you see is unrecognizable, completely unrecognizable. But the whole notion of surgery has been revolutionized by the kinds of technologies that for some reason, that I don't know of because I'm not a doctor, facilitate surgery. Now above is a classroom that I took on a trip to, uh, it was Israel, this one. Um, and if you look at that classroom and you took, take a look at the classroom beside it, there isn't that much that's different. That yeah, they have laptops on their desk, but everything else is set up to look much the same. So basically the premise is we aren't moving fast enough with the way we mediate and understand communication. Okay, so we still need to teach language for yesterday uh, because most literature was archived using a scribal technology of one sort or another. You know, as I, as I talk, I'm just gonna check in, Olga, with you. I don't know how many people are using translation in this workshop and whether I speak too fast. And I just wanna make a quick check with you to see if you could let me know, because I shouldn't be galloping if it's causing problems. For me, everything is fine, thank you. The pace of your speech is ideal and we do not have translation. This session is not translated. Oh, in English? Okay. All right. Then you guys are going to have to get the full onslaught of Canadian English with all of my little idioms and everything else. Okay, great. So we still need to do this because language is archived uh, in this kind of scribal technology, and it has been in manuscripts and books for a millennium. And so it's not like we can sort of say we don't need it. However, we keep this in place as long as we think language consists of four skills, and as long as we manifest academic performance in things like essays and test it in standardized tests. Now, I don't know what your assessment situation is, and you will be telling me as we get going, but pretty much everybody's got to face these sort of beats somewhere. They're entrenched in society, they're entrenched economically and politically in, in educational systems, and they just hold us backwards. Okay, so all of those sorts of um, kinds of language, of reading, writing, speaking, listening, were hypothesized according to the media of the day. Now we've had huge media changes. And so over the past three decades, which those of us who've taught for all of that time, and there seem to be a few of us here, we have worked with. And so we have to consider what's happened to language with Web 1.0, uh, for instance, which is not much. It was just a web of information connections in the 90s. And if people are young enough, they won't even really remember this. And that gave us what was called hypertext, early multimodality, blogging, some gaming, chat forums, things like that. A lot of people working with digital language are still working there. And it's like, uh, no, you know, that was 20 years ago. About 2004, thereabouts, um, there were big changes in how the web worked. And we had a web of people connections, the web 2.0. This gave us social media, participatory culture, collaborative authoring, dynamic text, read-write interactivity. And we haven't managed too badly with that. A lot of our current theories of multimodality kind of feed into that era. 
But not long afterwards, we creeped into a kind of um, Web 3.0 situation. And it really is a sort of creep of sorts, you know, that kind of stealthily kind of invaded a lot of our communication media. With this, we have things that we use invisibly every day, mobile computing, for example, which is absolutely essential to all of us now. We have post-human communication, which we are going to talk about, the good and the bad. With that, we have a lot of bad surveillance culture, big data, uh, algorithmic data filtering, internet, eh, good, bad, I don't know, internet of things. But we do have good as well. The point is we can't ignore any of it. And a lot of where our theorizing goes does not keep up with that era. Right, so teaching for today and tomorrow means we really have to think about language, not just as a structural abstract, but as a semiotic resource. And so this really takes you through the theorizing of people like Cress, working with um, social semiotics background. Um, and in this kind of theorizing, which takes us, as I say, fairly nicely through Web 2.0 social media contexts, we're, we're managing this not too bad. I, I don't know how well people are managing academically with these kinds of assignments, but we are going to do one. This, of course, is not new. I found you a beautiful old church Slavonic um, manuscript from mm, about 14th century. I thought it was really quite lovely. That is really produced in the same way, minus the digital mediation, as our graphic novel below, which is a piece of academic text, by the way, produced by a student. And they're produced in a sort of production team manner, uh, except the production team is one person in this century where it was many people in the 14th century. And with mediation, that's very powerful and allows us to do this. But we've got yet another generation and I don't think we are working quite as well with this. And this is the post-human era that's come in with Web 3.0 capacities. Um, with this, we're going to do a little wee bit of work, but this is really a very kind of open situation that we're currently working in, my, our own research team here. And I really invite you to let me know what you are doing in this sphere and have tried and see as possible. We use a lot of these things every day, for instance, the artificial intelligence of machine translation. Uh, some of us use conversational digital agents a lot, some of us don't, um, but these are the help programs you have in your phone. Uh, there are standalone programs that you can get to put in houses, although I wouldn't recommend it. Nonetheless, there are many different sorts of forms of this disembodied robot robotic communication device that are around. These things are basically software programs. They are not, they don't have intelligence within them. But as we move on, more and more artificial intelligence is being moved into these. And we have to be aware of what's happening and be in as good control as possible of it. Otherwise, it'll control us. So we have a little, <clears throat> excuse me, warm up exercise. <clears throat> which is, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, icons only. And you're looking at this and thinking, well, you know, this is kind of a silly thing to do. But I want to show you the power of emoji for language learners, depending on what level of course you teach, but also just as a kind of exercise to see how they function as words, to do a kind of rebus writing. And <clears throat> emoji, I think, are very interesting as a sort of new lexico grammatical form. We have a whole keyboard for them now. We have keyboards of emoji and they can be inserted everywhere and they are. And with them, um, the idea is to add nuance and emotional nuance to something. 
But these function really beautifully as a sort of base idea for where we're going to go with multimodal text. So this is, of course, a multilingual text. This says, hi, I'm from Canada. I play the violin and I like to dance. It also says, bonjour, je suis canadienne. Uh, j'aime beaucoup jouer du violon et j'aime beaucoup danser. And it also says, hola, yo soy canadiense. Uh, toco el violín y a mí me gusta bailar. It says the same thing in lots of different languages. And so therefore, it functions really very powerfully, cross-linguistically, where it's needed to do the job of helping. Now, people are not going to use emoji everywhere, but they are going to use icons. So the first thing that I want to do is to exit from the share and to get you guys to each do a little one. And I'm just trying to think of how, I wonder if it's easiest to put them in the chat. Um, I'm just thinking of how we'll, let me just get over this so I can stop the share. I can't see my mouse. Uh, come on. There we go. All right, I'm just trying to think of how we can show them, whether the chat would work best. Uh, right, let's try a few. So take a minute and with whatever you wish to use, I want you to do a very, very short emoji only introduction. Open for questions if you got them, but it's pretty easy. I have smiles. I don't have activity. <laughs> I'm looking at the chat. I got one smiley face. <laughs> Does anyone have a clue how to use emoji in, in Zoom? Uh, well, if you write it just on any word process, try it in the chat. Will it work in the chat? Let's just see. Uh, yeah, we'll watch this. There you go. Oh, hang on. Can you get it directly in the chat? Yes, we see, we see. We see it. I don't know. I, I've never tried to use anything like that. So we are just 100 <laughs> beginners. <laughs> Starters. We haven't even started on what I'm going to get. Please teach how to do it. So where is this top that gets the emoji into the text? Oh, oh okay. My so we... internet connection thwarts me completely. You know, because I haven't heard half of your instructions even. Okay, so you have a keyboard that you're using of some sort. If, you have a, if you're working on a mobile oh, phone, yeah. I don't think so by the size of most of the squares I see in front of me. You'll have, you can toggle it. If you're working on um, a laptop, uh, which I am right now, you, you have a functional key of some sort, but I don't, I, I use a Mac. Um, so on the Mac, you just have to hit function. I may have set it up to do that though. So let's see if any of you can find it. No luck so far. Really? But this whole emoji thing is really interesting because um, it kind of hints towards getting back to hieroglyphics, you know? Yes, yes, yes. It's logography. That's exactly right. I don't know if anybody here reads any... Oh, good. Here we go. Beautiful. Um, could I have Anna read this in whichever series? I got the bicycle, the flag. 
and I see the laptop, and the very first one is a wave, right? So let's hear you, you and read it in whichever languages you choose. Yeah, well, so actually I attempted to uh, paste a Russian flag there, but for some reason, Zoom changed it into RU. Yeah, but what I was going to say is just hi, I'm Russian, I work online, and I like cycling. It does say that I have a flag. I have a flag, it came up on mine. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Any more? That's not right. good. Well done. <laughs> We've still got people looking for how to get their emoji together. Yeah, so actually I took them from a social network. I wrote them uh, there in a message box and I used Contactian, and then I just copied them from Contactian and <laughs> pasted them here. Okay. Because uh, I couldn't find them uh, in the Zoom chat. They won't like be in the one. Zoom chat. It will be in your own laptop keyboard choices. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> we'll get one more, and then I'll show you why I wanted to start with this. So I'm waiting for one more brave person. And uh, hmm. We'll just see. They should just come from your own laptop rather than from anything internal to Zoom. Let's just see what I can do here. Um, here's where we are right now. Let me just see. I think this will be very familiar, though I think you are ahead of us with your inoculate. Oh, there's another one. Beautiful. So that is, oh dear, Nadia? Would that be right? I guess that's me. Hello. Did I say it anywhere nearly close to right? Um, my name's Irene. Oh, I wasn't uh, even close. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I just tried uh, to uh, insert emojis as well. Uh, so I wanted, I tried at least to say uh, it. Uh, sorry. Um, I am uh, a teacher of English. And I specialize in working with young learners. And at the same time, I am um, a student of a master's degree program. Um, so I am an undergraduate. So right. this is the information. Right. Beautiful. Lovely. And Andy, what do we got? Oh, Andy, hi. <laughs> what have we got? Andy, I hear, I see you, but I, I don't. Idea. There, there we are. Hi, how are you? How come you didn't put your picture on? Um, I've been somewhere else. It took oh. me about to get in. They wouldn't let me in. I wasn't. Oh. <laughs> Persona non grata. I love it. <laughs> Can you read what you've got? Quick Google search. Press the Windows key and a period, and you get all the uh, all the emojis you want. All right, you've got a smiley face and then you have an old school smiley face with rosy cheeks, right? Yeah. And I can... Okay, I'll, yeah. I'll, take, I'll take everybody out of your, your agony. We'll go back to what we were doing. So you, you can see what, where I was going with this. Okay, so here we go, share. All right, so I do have things for young children and I'm gonna show you now what, um, there we go. Oops, all right. Okay, so um, this is something that we have used. If we do have people who teach young children, I'm really glad because I, I gave a couple of texts right here that we did in a primary school, right? So I think I just took myself my picture off. I'm sorry about that. Let me, I did that accidentally. Uh, or is that, does that come off? Olga, did I do that? Did I take my picture off? Or what happened there? Uh, I'm not sure, well, never mind, doesn't matter, anyhow. So, okay, so let me just play this. Okay, great, there we go. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna show you uh, a couple of assignments we did with children. Uh, at an elementary school. These kids are, you see, the little boy in the top, um, 10 years old, 10 years-ish. 
And you can work with icons first to bring people together if they're really completely raw beginners and they're sort of struggling to try to find anything. You can communicate quite well if you start with iconic navigation, icon, you know, icons that are known and so forth. Now, then we have all kinds of facilities that we can bring in. Some of them good old Web 3.0 uh, help that we can bring in. And I've done that today in the next slide. I'm going to show you where I did a little, a little comic myself. And I, I made it English and Russian, though I know no Russian, I'm afraid I have to say. And I've gone from Google Translate, which of course is very imperfect, but it is a start across to uh, a person and then you've got something to discuss and that's where the learning begins really. Um, I'll tell you what these two projects um, were and you can see how multimodality helps you layer, these are both school projects, uh, layer opportunities for meaning making which is what we're looking at. So you can tell that the, slide, the um, screen grab in the right hand, top right hand corner is uh, a video of some sort. And in fact, if you look, you'll see that it's actually um, a television, um, um, TV Ontario. I don't know if you can see that much uh, cut that I've taken. And so we did this project under research project that I was doing where we had children pick a research topic about their parents and how they came to Canada. That was one of the, the topics. Um, this is a school with um, over 90% immigrants in it, a very, very high percentage. And you normally only have to go back a generation or two to have an immigration story. Many people live in multi-generational homes. So this little fellow, uh, who I believe was born in Canada, went back to his, his father and asked him. So he did a research assignment, essentially, where you have a question, you take it, and you go to people who can help you answer it. And this was, of course, taped so he's got his own little source of information that he can work with and then he did a comic his comic that he did on the left you can see he hand drew so these are in panels uh and you can use any slide tray you want for this kind of thing um and he he wrote out the story of how his father came to canada the interesting thing there of course was that his father had escaped a war and it was um, a situation of a, a refugee resettlement and these were things that no child you know here's the the, the grisly details of of war that are not necessary to know about. And so it was very illuminating for this little guy. So this then is turned into yet another kind, it is remediated yet again in a video where the comic is shown and the child talks about what he learned in doing it. So there's one example of layering multimodality and you add all kinds of devices for meaning making and for discovery. And this is done, you can see he's a little guy, he's about nine or 10 years old. And this is done at this level. And below, we have another very exciting project, I think, um, which was a talking book, which also worked with uh, children of about the same age. Here, it would be called grade five. It is the fifth uh, year of grade uh, school, but there's also in Ontario, we have two years of kindergarten before that as well. So these children are about, you know, 10 years old or so. And the slide that you see at the bottom uh, comes from uh, a YouTube, a talking book. And this followed the children being asked um, uh, to, to think about how people are the same and how people are different. And this came after there was uh, a slur heard on the, a playground that was considered to be anti-homophobic. And the teachers were concerned. This is, um, this is a country where homosexuality is legal. 
And this is not an attitude that we like in school. And it's a kind of bullying attitude. So the, the, the teachers were concerned and they, they, they thought that we'd all get together and do this assignment. This was part of a, a large research project where we were looking at project-based learning for children that was highly multimodal. So um, the children talked about what was the same about people. How were people the same? And then, you know, you can think about how people were different, but the project came out really beautifully because children used their differences to show how they were the same. And I think I will just, I'm just gonna see, oh yeah, we got enough time. I'm just going to put on a little wee bit of it. Might be a little yeah, bit. Creoles are included. We all have feelings. We all have feelings. We all have a family. We all have a family, man. Sorry, Hannah. Uh, we all have a home. Can you play it again? I'm not sure that we can see the video. No, not see, you're not seeing it? Ladies, gentlemen, can you see the video? No. No? no. Uh, so, so no? You. Will, you, will you try? Again, sorry. Uh, you want me to try again, or do you want me just simply to hang on? We just we just see this white screen. I I think it's a good idea to try again. We have plenty of time. No. Ah, I know. Uh, Heather, you are sharing the screen. Can you stop? I, I'll teach you. Can you stop sharing the screen? Stop. At, at, the, at the bottom of the screen, uh, uh, we have this green button sharing the screen. And then mm -hmm. when another icon opens, there are two little boxes like sharing the sound and the video. If you tick, then we'll watch the video. Ah, okay. Uh, this is what I had on though. Let's try and we'll see. Anything show yes. up for you? Yes, yes. That's oh, it. okay. So I've got to stop the share before I go back to another program. Aha, here we go. I'm sorry, I'm yes. Good? I'm yes. Yeah, we all just need okay. We all have feelings. We all have feelings. We all have a family. We all have a family, man. We all have a home. We all have smiles. We all have smiles, man. All the team, what do we all feel young? We all need to eat. We all need to we eat. We all need to eat. At the museum, I'm Miss Okay, so I'm going to stop share and share again and see if I can get back to, all right, okay, hang on, this, sorry about that, uh, hang on, there we go, I'm just going to get rid of this and uh, make sure I've still got this going, okay, and all right, Man, this is more complicated than I thought. All right. This is what the pandemic taught us, right? To know which buttons to press. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, basically, that's what we're talking about today. So here we are, and I am learning a lot as I go. Here we go. Let's try this again. So, all right, are we back? Do we have it all happening again? Yes. Yes. All right, let me go on from this, because this is a look at how this can be done with children. And that's essentially, you know, a research assignment. But we're going to take a look at uh, a research assignment at the university level. Now, just to preface that, um, this work, we have moved from project-based learning, which I'm very much a fan of, which brings together people in different departments and puts people together so the teachers collaborate as well as the learners. And projects are developed that take material from different places. There's mathematics, there's language, there's geography. There's lots of stuff that goes together. And I mean, I would, if I were still doing research in schools, which I'm not, I would be putting forward, how do we fix the pandemic situation we are in? There's no problem that's too big for people to work on. Anyhow, this is not often really uh, sort of done at the university level where there's, there's a great deal. There are projects, certainly, but they always are to fit a template. They're always to fit an examination kind of 
criterion of some sort. And, and they're, they're kind of premeditated for the classroom, not for the world at large. And so I'm working with a colleague whose name is Kurt Thumlert. And we are working on something which is really his theoretical idea, which is called production pedagogies. And this is a quote from, from him and, and other people who I have worked with as well. Production pedagogies are premised on the view that people learn best and most deeply through designing networked cultural artifacts that have use value and that matter to their makers. So this is very much in the school of, of, of um, learning by making and learning by doing, which we do much more of in the grade school kind of arena than we do at universities, uh, sadly. So the text you are looking at now is an academic text. I want you to think about it that way. Because when you look at it, you see a graphic novel page or a comic or something like that. It is a sort of more complex form of one of the assignments that you looked at on the former page. And this assignment uh, is an example of a production pedagogy. The assignment that was worked on was uh, a combination of thinking about what a graphic novel is and how you use a graphic novel, which increasingly these days is a form that's being used for increasingly more serious topics. Um, but the, the topic that, of, that generates this particular uh, graphic novel is one of, of concern to the author, the student as author. And so a lot of the work I do, I work with collaborative authorship because if you can get people working together, that's the first premise of how all these media work. They work by people working together. And in this case, this is a theme that a number of people picked up, which is uh, 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 something about racial bias that a lot of people experience. And we have the author in a selfie in the right hand corner. And it is the issue of what you look like and whether that fits in what people think the culture is all about. And the question that's very often asked is the question at the top of this. Now, where are you really from? And this is, this is a really, for people who are asked that question, it's a, a very negative experience because your answer may well be, I am really from Toronto. I was born here and this is my town, same as yours. And it's, it's, it's not asked of people who look like me, you know. It is asked of people who look like this author, though she's gonna sound just the same as I do. And so you have to have an issue that's very much of concern to the learner, to the author, because the learner and the author are one and the same. I like to work with collaborative authorship very, very, very much. So that's how I prefer to do it. This one is a single author, this one. And the collaborative production also belongs to those of us who are on the other side of the plat. Well, if you are on the other side of the podium, if you're not sitting with them and working with them, it belongs with us too. We collaborate with them, we collaborate with each other. Now, the, the genre itself is important. So it isn't a fill in the blanks kind of, I found a template. Now I'm just going to fill in pictures that work. It doesn't work like that at all. You need to have something to say and you need to choose your resources. But here is where language becomes a semiotic resource for you because you can do this with very imperfect language. You can do this with, um, with, with the resources that you have. That's the idea. And then it gets worked and worked and collaboratively, eventually you get to the point and of of working through the language learning that accrues in doing the project. So we have these tools available to us in our cell phones. We have very, very powerful toolkits in our cell phones. Our cell phones we carry today, and even if you don't walk around with the latest one, you don't need the latest one, these are more powerful than the supercomputers of 20 years ago. You have to remember that. These are amazingly powerful uh, toolkits for us. 
Now, I have more to say about that later because you need to be in control of that power. And that is, that is a really very important point. However, at this point, we are. So you, you use the, pro the programs or the tools that facilitate what you want to do. You never use something that constrains the production because that's counterproductive, obviously. And we encourage very much um, the, the inclusion of the author in the piece. You know, this is subjectivity plus. You put yourself into the text. You see yourself in the text you've created. That's what we can do. You know, you see yourself on the page there. You can use anything. I can't draw personally, you know, you, yeah. So some people can, you know, and if you can draw, that's a beautiful way to add images that do not have to be prefabricated in some way, shape, or form. Photos are great, and to have the, the author of the text on one or another side of the lens is absolutely ideal. And there are, if you really want them, you know, cartoon programs and so on that can be selected from. And it's the same as any storyboard dialoguing kind of, uh, kind of process. But one of, the, one of the benefits of AI is some of the assignments we have have people out. You don't need to be in a classroom for this, of course, as we haven't been for over a year now here. Um, and so, but we're not really out in the street either because we're still in lockdown currently in, web, in our third wave of this nasty bug. But you would have students with uh, phones in places and then you can use the facilities of just-in-time digital tools, uh, AI help, and things like that. That's where that starts to come in handy. Uh, you can animate these uh, these texts. Um, you you can you can create videos with it. You can embed them in, vi in videos. You can have bilingual dubbing. Uh, you can have conversational with different voices. The sky is kind of the limit, and we're going to go and try to do one. So I did you a real simple one. And I followed the rules. I took an issue that I cared about. Now, this is obviously not an academic text and obviously not very serious either. But the issue was this, pandemic lockdown hair. Because we haven't had a hairdresser open here since um, November of 2020. And so I took a very silly selfie and sent it to my daughter and said, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know? And then I then I decided I'd put a poster on Facebook where I had the, all the bad hair I could think of all together. And I'm afraid some of the political leaders of the time were wonderful candidates for this. And uh, David Bowie back in the day and oh, an ad for a local kind of pizza where poor mama has really bad hair. So I decided maybe I'd try to do it in Russian. Now you have to tell me how good or how bad this is and, and, and where it needs to be done because I, I can't actually read it. But this would be for me a tool to learn because I started it, I wrote it in English. I mean, it's very simple. And then I had an idea, well, if the hairdressers aren't open, then guess what? I'm going to have to cut my hair myself. So my husband and I bought some hairdressing scissors and we set to work on our hair and, and there's the result. Okay, so this is a very small uh, text that shows a problem, a problem solved, a problem of concern, and authorship and the resolution of the problem. As I say, it's a very silly text. So I went on to Google Translate to see, okay, what will I need here? And so I tried it all. And then I looked at it and I thought, you know, I haven't got the vaguest clue whether this is any good or not, because Google Translate is just that, or any other machine translation. It's a very rough tool that provides a starting point. That's all it gives you. It gives you a starting point. And with what you get, then if you can seek out some human help, you've got a whole conversation there. And of course, human help can be sought out anyway in person, online, you know, any kind of connection to do that. So one of our recent hires at York, uh, where I used to be the, the associate dean, uh, and I was involved in the hiring, was um, a very impressive uh, 
youngish woman who uh, is originally from Russia and then uh, went to British Columbia and we managed to snag her from the University of British Columbia. And I thought, maybe I'll send it to her. So I sent it to her and said, um, Natalia, can you help me? And she said, yeah, she said, you know, I would say this a little differently and this a little differently and grammatically you're going to have to do this and this. So I just copied and pasted what she gave me. And this would be the moment where we would get together and I'd say, can, can you read it to me? And, 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 and we would, that's where the language learning would start with this project. Now, what, um, let's take a look. What I think I'd like to do at this point is I'm gonna stop share if I can get my, okay, yeah, I'll do that first. There we go, stop share, go back to you. And um, I'd like to know if you've done anything like this, if you've done any projects of this sort using multimodality this way. And I'd like to ask if you'd like to give it a crack to see if you could do something quite simple. We have quite a lot of time. I know it's been a long day for you. That took me maybe 20 minutes to do. And you use what you have. You know, you have photos, you have camera. We're all looking at ourselves. You could take a picture of all of us right here and right now, actually, and use that. So you have many, many resources. And all of these resources contribute to meaning making. So let me just check whether you think you might want to give this a crack. We say maybe 10 minutes or so to see if you could. Now, um, the program that I tend to use is Comic Life, which is a very open uh, program. It's not going to constrain you. You can use any comic maker. But I want to caution you that a lot of them will make you use their characters. And I am going to caution you away from that because then you start to do what it wants you to do rather than it doing what you want it to do so you create something. Um, but, you know, you can use a piece of paper and just kind of and draw it and take a snapshot. Uh, you can use a plain old word processor and put a few boxes in it and a couple of pictures in it. I mean, there's, you can use anything. You know, it's really simple. Shall we give it a try? What do you think? Uh, not sure how to read the faces. Yes, maybe give it a crack. I'm seeing some, some smiles. It's a good sign. You're going to have to tell me something. <laughs> Olga, what you read on this? <laughs> I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to communicate with other people who wanted to attend this masterclass, but oh I was instructed not to let anybody in, sorry. So it's not connected with the topic. Uh, just to give you a little break, Heather, I was not planning that, but I see maybe people need to put their ideas together. Hmm. Uh, when I need to regroup students in my classroom, and they are third year students, language of diplomacy, so very serious topic, and I want them to relax a bit, I give them little pieces of paper with little pictures, and they need to uh, unwrap and find their partner according to the picture. And I put very, very simple pictures, such as a snail, for example, and sometimes they ask each other, what's the word for that? If this is learning, this is what you mean <laughs> then this yes, is the start <laughs> yeah that's absolutely a start although i would not like to connect snails with people personally but no no no, no. it's not about connecting people and pictures just <laughs> they find two pictures in the classroom with a letter or a picture of a car or some primitive pictures that i can draw together <laughs> yeah i mean pictures don't have to be elaborate they can be or they can't be the other thing i could do is just open it up for your questions if you'd rather i mean i like if we were together i'd make you work you know because it's through doing that you get a better sense and it's not that it's not difficult it's not difficult at all um but it's much more awkward on zoom because we are we are in different parts of the world you know and and uh different times of the day and things like that 
So I can also open it up for questions. I got a couple in the chat, I see. If you'd prefer just to ask. No, I, I see the comment that people are working on the task. All right, so I'll shut up for 10 minutes and, um, and we'll come back together in about 10 minutes. So you, you work away on it, how's that? Okay, so it's been about 10 minutes and that's probably only enough just to kind of get a start. We can do a couple of things. What I would love to do is to have you um, share, but that might also put you on the spot with something that's been a very short attempt at something that I would encourage you to keep doing to see how it works. Uh, one of the things we've learned over the years is that um, the teacher's really got to play. The teacher has to play with the tools. We've learned that thoroughly, that the teacher, the, the lecturer, the professor, however you see yourself as the person guiding the class, uh, you've got to go and play with the tools. Now, having done that, you also have to be prepared to learn because nobody knows everything and you have a class full of people who will all know things you don't know, just like today, you know, and you, you, ha you have to be prepared to actually share and have people who can take, who can guide through, through uh, various uh, ideas or tools and things like that. So why don't I just open it up to see if you've got any problems or questions or things you'd, you'd like to, to share so far. Is it challenging? Is it easy? Is it fun? Is it not fun? Is it silly? Does it have potential where you teach? Because it can. But one of the things that just came up in the chat that is really important is that um, this is real world stuff. A lot of the problem with classrooms is that Learning is artificial, it's for the classroom. You go into the classroom, you have a security because you can, you, can, you can speak in the world of the classroom, speaking a language, you can speak in the world of the classroom, you know the world of the classroom and, and that's fine. And then the world of assessment for what you learn in the classroom is similarly constrained. So you walk into the assessment and it's constrained for the classroom context. So you're working within a micro world. Production pedagogies, try to take real world issues, racism, um, bullying. Um, I mean, and in the university level, that's, that's what the children did. Um, and, and the university they use racism as well, of course, but that would be couched within something much more sociological or geographical, uh, urban society and so on. And you are the specialists in the kind of English or the kind of language you teach. Um, I'm not a specialist with young children uh, or with journalists, you know, I, 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 I'm a linguist uh, and um, when I work with young people who teach young children, I work with them. They're the people who know what they're doing. So you have to put that knowledge together. So you have to know for your context, but whatever it is, whether it's kindergarten children or postgraduate students, the work really should be of meaning outside of the classroom. So with the children, a bullying story or a story about um, um, racism or uh, refugee settlement, those stories become very interesting to children when they realize that not everybody has the same opportunity to be safe. Some people have to live in, in war zones. Uh, you don't know that if you don't have bombs falling on your head, which fortunately we you know, we don't have problems we don't have. So that's a real world problem that, that, that you have to tackle with. At the university level, you take it up to, to, to any level of what you're working with. And indeed, the real exam is if the problem you solve is, is, is relevant on a bigger stage. That's the real test, as it were, in the world of production pedagogies. But let me just be quiet for a minute and see if anybody, I have some other ideas I'm going to give you, but I just want to see if you'd like to say anything about what you tried to do here. I'm, I'm very happy to 
you have the questions, I don't. So I need you to ask them. Are you usually so quiet? <laughs> Do you want me to go on? What's your read, Olga? What do you think? <laughs> Dear, oh, listener, really dear listeners, can you, sh can you show the pictures of what you are doing? So I, I'm just a moderator. I just, I'm focusing only on the quality uh, of this connection. So uh, yeah, can, can, can you show what you have been doing? So thank you very much for the idea. Actually, I've tried, I've downloaded Comic Live on my mobile phone. Yes, and I've been trying to create something like a comic, but it's not a comic. After all, I don't know how to show it. So maybe, oh uh, no, that will... Oh, it looks beautiful, actually. Something like that. Actually, I took the photos that I had in my mobile. Right. So the thing is, so when I, uh, I work with students, um, and we discuss lots of things, and I thought uh, it might be a task for them to uh, make some motivating picture to explain how to achieve goals. Mm -hmm. Well, as for me, I play tennis and I do yoga, and we can take this <laughs> so philosophy of yoga uh, to achieve our goals in our lives. So we should stay calm, we should uh, uh, concentrate, and then we will achieve everything. And actually, that photo is from a tennis tournament. Uh, I took place a few months ago and I took the second prize and I'm very proud of myself. And so, so I tried <laughs> to do something uh, motivating for my students that uh, they should try and they will succeed. Oh, that's lovely. And you did it right there on your phone like that in 10 minutes, which excellent. So I tried my best. <laughs> I think I could do better if I had some more time. I'm not very good at these things, but- That's the first time through. Are you kidding? Yes, it's my first time. I will uh, work uh, on this program. Thank you for the idea. And I think I will use it in, during my classes with my students. I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And I think it's a beautiful job. And I oh, think thank you. we have some more, I think I see. Good. Anybody else able to show us what you've got, please? I know there's one more. At least. Anna, Anna Uspianska. Yeah, hi. Actually, I just wanted to ask uh, what application Exana used, because for me, it's difficult to find tools. Um, yeah, so the tools I can think of personally are, for example, Google Slides, which I often use uh, well, and I'm sure that everybody else and you can use videos there and you can insert various photos that you find on the internet and it's really handy uh, but uh, when i ask my students for example to create something of the kind i guess that i should ask them to use certain tools which i myself actually don't know <laughs> so Oksana, could you please tell us uh the what application you used on your actually he there has told us about this uh, application comic life Mm -hmm. okay. I just found it in um, so somewhere <laughs> in the market and uh, mm -hmm. downloaded it. It's just for free and it took two minutes to download it. And so uh, it will take some time to get uh, to know how to use it, but it's quite simple. Yes, it is. And it's interesting, really. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. We use Comic Life a lot, but I don't, trust me, I. I I mean, I'm not here to sell comic life. I have no urge to do that. But we have, what we have found with comic life is that it's a, a more, um, it's more open to creativity. Uh, we're looking for the, the learner being the agent of their own learning. That's really important. And comic life requires you to design many other there are a lot of other online comic programs but they do everything for you 
and this um, I'll be speaking a little bit more on tomorrow is not what anyone wants. You really don't want that because then you're not thinking. You are not using your own design potential, and and it's 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 a constraining activity. It's it's not a, a good one. You can use very simple tools, but yes, you're absolutely right. You need to play with the tools. You're right. You need to get out there and to try a few and to try to do them. But there is no problem in giving an assignment for people to, to uh, find the tools that work best for them and then to share them in the class. You don't have to do all the heavy lifting. Now, you're going to have to learn it as well. But um, you don't have to do all the work. Basically, there's a lot of work to find a tool that, you know, or a number of tools that work for you. Uh, you can share that labor really easily, but you will have to play around with them to see how they work. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, oh, we got another one here. Uh, I'm going to... Ah, okay, right. Super. Okay, let me, in that case, I'm going to, because I have some other ideas for you as 10 past, and we will have some more uh questions so yeah so let me share my screen again and okay here we go let's play this okay so we got the bad pandemic here by the way how was the russian was it uh i can't now see you but you can tell me later okay so there's lots of other ideas. Um, you know, a comic maker program is, 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 is a good start and it, it, it really provides you with beautiful opportunities for plurilingual and bilingual texts, uh, which is what I work with. I work, since I, I work with um, people who speak lots of different languages, the situation in schools, for instance, um, these days we work with mobile language learning very much, but the last serious piece of research I did, which was a decade long piece of research, worked within elementary schools in the Toronto District School Board. And uh, there are, you know, there are hundreds of languages active. As, as one person described at your university, uh, 90 odd languages in, in within your student body, which is, I mean, substantial, you know, if I have the size of your university right, I'm not sure I do. I work at a university of 55,000 students, so 6,000 doesn't sound big. I'm wondering if you meant 60,000. Anyhow, that doesn't matter. So we have to work in classrooms where people speak all different languages. And so very often the political judgment is, oh, you can't do that, but of course you can. You can. You can use whatever you have to begin conversations because people have the same worries. The pandemic is a worry to everybody. Whatever language you're speaking, it's the same pandemic, it's the same problem. So even with little children, you have similar problems, whether it's how to tie your shoes or uh, racist bullying, which is a serious problem and you don't want to be, you want to be working positively to overcome such a problem. Okay, so um, we have other ideas as well, of course. So here we are, and this is a linguistic landscape that I've got. These are pictures from Toronto. I have not gathered them in any kind of larger text and the kind of larger text could be whatever you want to do. You could have an assignment, you could make a video out of it, you could do a video uh, at the time and in the place of uh, people functioning within a micro community. Uh, you can do all kinds of things. The idea of a linguistic landscape is to look at how language policy is embedded in um, different levels of uh, a, a city, for instance. And so the pictures that I have here uh, include, and I've got something that I've got to get rid of at the top or I won't be able to see. Uh, I can't even see what I've got at the top. Um, but there are various scenes. In, oh, yes, I know what it is. It's from my favorite Polish deli. That's what it is. And it's got food from there. Um, I have a really curious one underneath it that says French cafe. But if you take a look at the, the language used over it, you have words in Chinese. Now, I, 
I may not know Russian, but I, I do know some Chinese. And I can tell you that the letters above it relate to another business altogether. They do not say French cafe. Um, below that, you will be able to read that actually. Uh, and it is the Ukrainian Credit Union, which is in the uh, neighborhood directly to the south of me here is a, a very lovely, a very popular area with lots of fun uh, delis where you can get, you know, beautiful kind of sausages and things like that. And it, it was um, uh, settled by Ukrainian, German, uh, Polish, and some Russians as well, although not so many. It's, it's it, the major kind of majority group is U Ukrainian, maybe Ukrainian, Polish, pretty much half and half. Um, and it's just immediately to the south of me. Uh, the area I live in is uh, a Maltese area with some Italian in it. So th those are historic settlements, but that's what you would find if you did a linguistic landscape of this area. If you move to the left, you've got a picture that was an artwork. Uh, I needed an, an entire class to help me. I can read the two middle characters in Chinese, which say China, Zhangguo, which, which are middle kingdom, middle country. And that's the name of the country. But it was apparently a beautiful, and I think maybe Persian um, poem. And I had a member of my class who, who knew the 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 poetry and the poetry had said something about you could walk something about China in it. And so this was a graphic representation using the orthographies of, of both of the languages and cultures referenced in the poem, which I thought was quite beautiful. I took it out of somebody's idea of urban design. So I'm sure the people using it had no idea what they had up there. Much like I see tattoos people wearing all over the place. So I'm sure they have no idea what they have on their bodies. Below is what you have in Canada. We have a bilingual English-French country, which sometimes gets very much in the way of the languages that people really do speak in communities. Because in Toronto, there's a very small percentage of people who speak French. You would find many more people able to speak Ukrainian than French in the city of Toronto, barring all of the formal language classes and so on. But what's curious about this one is it's, well, I mean, I, I know it's kind of a rude sign because it's where you take your guide dog to poo. But anyhow, what's curious about it is that this, this sign came from Toronto and it says Chien Guide in the top and guide dogs in the bottom. But in point of fact, that would normally be reversed here. You would have guide dogs in the top and you would have Shangyid at the bottom because English is by far the majority language over the English-French divide in this country in Toronto. But this sign comes from a campus of, of my university, of York University, that's a bilingual campus where French is, is privileged in ways that it wouldn't be in other parts of the city. So the, the assignment is about looking at languages, how they're embedded in society, and you work with it the way you want to work with and what you want to do. But that can turn very easily into a mapping project. You need your smartphone. You need this to be collaborative. This is not a single person project. You need to be working with people. You work on the policy. You can work on the history of an area because you have areas of sequential uh, everybody has historical areas, everybody. And so you have a particular neighborhood where, where, where this happened, where that group came in, where, where this event took place and so forth. And that history can be unearthed sometimes in very small pieces of visual information, the iconic information that guides you through things. And so however you shape the project, whatever it comes out, an interview, a video, a mock television show, uh, a graphic novel, however you decide to do it, there's the substance of one. And this connects learners, it connects creative multimodal production using what we call M-learning tools to place-based and site-specific urban inquiry. Now, Toronto is, for us, a big city of about 6 million people, but it's, very, it's, it's a spot in the bucket in Moscow, which is a very, very large world city. So you've got lots of fun areas, I'm sure, to go and look. And it connects the language you know with the language you're trying to learn. Plus, I mean, you can easily have a multilingual text and we've got lots of examples of those. Um, I'm also going to introduce, and this is a very generative um, assignment, uh, Twine. 
I don't, uh, I, I collaborate with, uh, I collaborate with my colleagues to design these things. Uh, and I collaborate with Kurt on the twine stories because he is, uh, he's a specialist in literary forms. So the two of us work together. The linguistic landscape would be my baby. I would know how to work with that very well. But the twine would be something he would normally give me help with. So, so I have, what I've done is I've put a URL in the bottom of a tutorial of how to use twine. This is a basic, it's free, it's free. It's free download and it's a basic branching story or game. And you can create a game because there are animation, uh, there's animation potential. And you can create a branching story, which is the basis of most games. If you say, if you are looking for a, let's, let's, take, let's take this suggestion, this, this, this situation we're in the pandemic. We're in a pandemic and you choose this option. We will, uh, put all of our money in this particular vaccine. In Canada, we, you have facilities, you're a very large country, you have facilities to develop and make your own vaccine. But our country is 30, I don't know, seven to 38 million people. And the political solution that was opted for was to buy uh, a vaccine. So let's say you, you choose this one, you're gonna buy this vaccine and that's your branch, or you choose that one. You choose that, and then your branching comes off of that. Oh, you've chosen that vaccine. That vaccine uh, is not something that's been tested on children. So you can't use it with children. So that leaves you a problem. So that your branching comes off of that, and that's an extremely generative program to work with in terms of production pedagogies, and you put your languages in everywhere. You use, you can use icons in those boxes. You can use different languages. You can create a treasure hunt that uses different languages and you must work your way through one language to find the next as well. And now we come, and I just realized how late it is. This is, ooh, okay. So, Here's Web 3.0 and what we've been doing with this. So we've moved on. There's really a lot of work and there's a lot of theory that generates how to work with layering modes of meaning on top of each other, remediating um, the media you have uh, and how to generate um, assignments that are meaningful to students, to the world, to their learning and so forth. We have recently been working, I have a little research group with digital immersion as potential. And I apologize that my examples are, are in French, um, but, it, but they're very simple. So I'm sure they won't cause any problem at all. And one of the benefits of automated voice activated help programs that are conversational is that they have a language, you can choose the language. You can say, right, I am going to turn my Siri into French, or I'm going to turn my Siri into Russian. And I will, if I have any question at all, I have to use Russian to talk to Siri. So I often have my Siri in French to give myself a little practice because I don't really use it from day to day in Toronto at all, but I, I like to, you know, if I have the chance to. I come from an area of Canada that's half English, half French. There are very few areas like that in the country, actually. But so it's fun to sort of polish it up a little. So we've been experimenting with using digital immersion, with exploring uh, the potential of conversational digital agents and AI potential within gaming platforms. And all just the simple stuff like you know Google Translate and things like that. My my colleagues include uh, there are two of us who work in language. There's myself, and my of course background would be English language. And our uh, research assistant, one of them, works in French as a second language. And then Kurt, my my colleague for many years now, works in. Uh, novels and literary forms in uh, creativity and digital creativity, digital tools and so forth. And our research uh, assistant from sort of his side 
is a young woman who works with science fiction literature and the ramifications in terms of visions of technology, post-humanism and things like that. So we have a very interesting group where we talk to each other. And we decided when we got our grant to do this and then the pandemic happened and we couldn't go and do the things we wanted to do that we'd start to experiment on ourselves. So we've been looking at this, uh, what we've come out with, and I'm getting very close to the end, so I, I just realized I better move this along. What we've found so far is that uh, it's great for pronunciation, because if you don't pronounce something in a way that the software is programmed to hear it, now that limits regional variation, which is a problem, but it also makes sure that you sound good enough that the program will actually understand you. So I've asked a really simple question here. Où se trouve la ville de Montréal? Which is, you know, where is Montreal? And she, um, Siri says, alors voilà Montréal. And here it is on a map. So this is a terribly simple interchange. But if I don't speak clearly enough, I'm not going to get through. So we tried to do it with kind of more conversational. And I have hidden my own page because I have too many things layered on top of it. So I say, bonjour, Siri, and Siri says, bonjour, uh, you know, and how can I help you sort of thing. And we have been experimenting with this. And of course, one of the big problems is that you're constrained by the software program. This is imagined as a help program, not as a sustained conversational but we keep trying to game it so that we get there. Um, and so that's where, you know, we're doing that now just to see what we can actually use it for and how we can find it helpful. Because if we don't, then we're overrun with apps that are unhelpful, like all these language apps that railroad students into retro pedagogies, lockstep learning, and oh, I, I'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, so very quick review. All right, we looked at icons and emoji as cross-linguistic aids to meaning. And the whole idea there is this is the idea of icons carrying meaning and being used within what you are doing strategically to help do that. We looked at uh, multimodal text layering opportunities for meaning making. Uh, we looked at production pedagogies, and we took a little bit of time and, you know, you have my email, and if you want to send me your graphic novel after, rather than sort of show everybody, please feel free to do that. Please, you know, email me and, and send it, because I'd love to look at it, and, you know, I can certainly comment if you want. And then we also had a very brief look at using AI. Now, there's a difference between artificial intelligence and a software program. The conversational digital agents that we have on our phones, you know, I don't, you know, I have Cortana who shows up in my, my email, um, Siri in my phone, and I, you know, I am not interested. And then, of course, when I'm driving, uh, there are also, um, GPS systems that, that I use, you know, turn left in, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So the difference between artificial intelligence is there's actually some sort of intelligence programmed into it. That does start to enter some of what we do in that there's algorithmic selection being done. This is much more the negative side of things. And tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit about the huge importance of being in control of the media so that you know what you're doing. Because if you don't know what you're doing, that media is doing something to you. But we can't avoid it. Like, we can't just sort of say, we're not going to do it. We can't do that at all. Okay. These references are, are for today and tomorrow, so I won't labor them. And I do have a huge thank you. Spasibo? Uh, How's that? So um, there we go, and I will escape out of this and uh, stop my share and see if I can see if I can answer any questions. I know I've taken you right to the margins, but I'm happy to answer anything that you'd like to ask. And you can also, of course, email. You're probably all just hungry. <laughs> uh, 
May I ask a question, please? Yes, of yes, course. Uh, yes, I just, um, so my research field is cognitive linguistics, and actually I'm very interested, uh, you showed the twine game, uh, did I pronounce it correctly, and uh, where you're branching stories. So uh, is it the same as cognitive maps? So is it, or is it a different thing? Yeah, it's Can very we? similar. Uh, so it's uh, the same technology, yes, and we can use it in cognitive linguistics as well, yes? Or I don't know. I don't work in cognitive linguistics. So, I mean, we would have a conversation about that and put it in front of us and look at it and think about it, but it is a basic branching technology. So, yeah, so it, I'm sure it is. Uh, I'm sure we're talking in the same plane of meaning, but I I mean, I would sit down with you and take a look at, at what you use and what you do. And again, I have become very used to teaching collegially and working collegially. So I don't think I can even answer the question. Like I'd bring in somebody, but I, I think we're probably in the same, shall we say, ballpark there. Yeah. Okay. The basic idea is a branching story. They work in games. We had a brilliant game a few years ago. We gave the kids... Uh, at, a, at the elementary school, which was after the Haitian, God, what was it, earthquake, I guess? And, and they had to do a branching story about if they had only this much money, what would you do? Would you send one child to school? Would you buy food? Would you do this? Would you that? So that's the same sort of notion. And then there are consequences for the choice you make. It sounds like it probably is similar. Uh, yes, yes, I think. Uh, thank you very much. I will try to use it. Mm -hmm. Can I try to uh, share my screen? Yes, yes. And uh, try to show what I have been trying to do. Yeah. To make. Beauty. <laughs> so I was trying to make a kind of, uh, I don't know what it is. <laughs> so I used the pictures <gasps> of my daughter. <Octopus. laughs> <laughs> yes. So kind of series of pictures and I was trying, but it was hard for me, you know, I'm using this thing, uh, like studio editor, yeah. yeah, that I found on the internet. Yeah. yeah, but it was quite difficult because I don't know all these tools, how to use them. So I needed more time. So it took me a lot of time to put uh, not the pictures, but all these uh, things uh, into the... <laughs> Uh, into the meme, but I guess <laughs> it was yeah. okay. Yeah, no, it does take time. No, you're absolutely right. Nobody said this was fast, and there's a lot of learning, you know. Yes, but, it <laughs> oh, was God, fun. <laughs> but it was fun. Thank you for the idea. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So the octopus, you're showing an octopus or a squid one. I mean, it looks a lot like an octopus to me. It's just, <laughs> it, that's it's an octopus. It's an yeah. octopus, yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I'm just wondering if your children will eat octopus because I'm thinking, wow. It, by the way, it was so sweet. It, it tasted nice. <laughs> it was really delicious. <laughs> yeah, My husband see, eats that and I, I just, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was okay. You see, it's even very catchy. So she pretended to be a fish or whatever, a oh, mermaid. 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 Beautiful. Oh, lovely. So this is studio editor? This is what you're using? Yes, studio oh, nice. editor or whatever. I just uh, put some into the uh, uh, engine here, a meme maker and meme okay. generator. Right, right, right. Meme okay. generator, yeah, so. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. oh, beautiful. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you can use anything. You make the tool work yes, too. Yes, yes, yes. That's yes. the idea. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, when yeah, you manage, yeah. When you manage, like, to uh, master it, it, it might be fun. <laughs> Yeah, no, they all, I mean, I like comic life because I'm sort of used to using it. Um, and that's what happens is you find stuff that works for you and you do it. You say, ah, oh, this, I know how to use this one. I'll do it. But it's really good to step out of that. And, you know, and that's what you have to do. Because if we don't know the tool, the problem is people, can, I used to give it to my students. They come and they say, oh, look what I made. And they would have got some fill in the blanks kind of program, like we had fill in the blanks exercises, right? Just put the word in there. 
what really that's not creative and so if you have a fill in the bank blanks video program not creative not creative no agency that was creative that was fun and congratulations if you got your children eating off the food <laughs> <laughs> taste deeper taste deeper <laughs> i know it's good i just like any, I've, I've taken you over time, but I'm very happy to answer any questions. I know you're tired. But it's, it's 11.30 in the morning for me, <laughs> so it's early. Shall I thank everyone then and, and say that I hope I see you tomorrow because tomorrow I'm going to give more the theoretical end of, of this. And I, I do write on it and I think not many people do. And I, it's important, I, I believe, for all of us who are concerned with language and language teaching I become very concerned here in my in my own city. I become very concerned with people who want to do back to basics and things like that because it pulls everybody back. We will never learn to deal with the world around us if we are using the tools of yesterday. So I want to thank everybody. You've been good sports and I thought you did a great job myself. I'm very happy to see anything that you've done if you want to you want to just send it to me and I'm going to be back here tomorrow um, to talk and so I'll have more to say then I, I hope you will join me then thank, thank you. you thank you everybody so goodbye to everyone thank you, thank well, you. Thank you very much. much it was thank interesting you. thank you bye bye, bye, -bye. very refreshing indeed. oh good <laughs> thanks <laughs> bye bye <laughs>